I'm going to hold this because I might move around. Is it actually working for you? Uh, is it now? Should we get the sound? That, that sounds like it's okay now. Um, okay, thank you very much for that welcome. Um, for those of you who haven't seen this technology before, it um, dives and swoops and if I'm talking complete rubbish, then you can go, oh, I'm really quite impressed with the technology, or alternatively, it makes me feel seasick, and either way, it diverts attention from what I'm saying. Um, but it starts with Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I love the humour of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I just want to share this with you. Um, this particular planet has, or rather, had a problem, which was this. Most of the people were unhappy for most of the time, Many solutions were suggested, but most of these were largely concerned with the movement of small green pieces of paper. Now, this was written back in the days when pound notes were small green pieces of paper. I, I don't know what they are in man, actually, but they're not in the um, mainland anymore. But, it's odd, because on the whole, it wasn't the small green pieces of paper that were unhappy. And that particular insight uh, came to my mind when I reflected that most of what we do in relation to child protection seems to involve referrals and reporting and record keeping, which is quite odd because referrals and reporting and record keeping is not what makes children safe. I'm going to talk about I'm going to explain why I'm going to say anything, what my right is to say anything. I'm going to talk about what the perceived problem is and what I think is a solution. I like to be positive. It fits with the positive action group theme. I am going to first introduce myself. I saw that I was described as a child protection expert and I was trying to work out. My problem with that is I kind of envisage that that means I have to say I've worked in child protection for the last 20 years or something like that. Um, I was reminiscing this evening along a slightly different vein. I was reminiscing how in 1992 was the first time that I sat in the High Court in a judicial review that I had brought, where the details of the case don't matter, but there was something that gets a bit repetitive after a quarter of a century, where the government was saying, well, we made the law, so the law must mean what we think it means. And anyway, we're the government, so we're going to do it anyway. And discretion means we can do what we like. And I was saying, now that's not right. We've got centuries of law about the right way to make fair decisions. And it isn't just do what you like. And I listened to a High Court judge deliver a judgment that explained to the government that actually... Discretion doesn't mean do what you like. There are rules about how to do things properly and you have to follow them. And the law doesn't mean what you think it means just because you wrote it. And that was a quarter of a century ago. And while the details of the case don't matter, I have been involved in a large number of cases over the years where the theme is quite repetitive, whether it is people who don't pay their poll tax should be put in prison, or children don't need help to, to deal with their special educational needs, or adults aren't entitled to community care, or people aren't entitled to discretionary education grants, and the list could go on. But the arguments are always basically the same, and I'm having to explain there are some bigger principles that govern what fairness looks like and what lawful procedure looks like. So, Four things that I've actually done that I'm going to make some reference to. I've actually brought court cases. I've actually written legal opinions. Quite recently, I finished writing a book. And as a result of an inquiry into a local authority in England that I was asked to carry out and its um, over-intervention, I have devised a conceptual framework for conceiving child protection services. And I'm going to refer to each of those things to explain, rather than claim expertise, I'll just talk about what I've done. 
in relation to bringing court cases, there's the Royal Courts of Justice down in London. Um, the one in particular to refer to, I think it might have been referred to in some of the literature, is a case brought against Haringey Council in relation to data protection and um, child protection, where we won the first human rights damages for unlawful child protection um, inquiry. There have been other cases for unlawful uh, care matters which have gone further, but this was an unlawful inquiry and it was the first time that we had seen that and it related in particular to data protection and human rights. Along the way, the court took trouble to explain how child protection inquiries can be damaging to families and you'll see can blight their lives irrespective of the nature and extent of the significant harm or of their involvement in it or of the reasonableness of the suspicion that generated the inquiry in the first place. It's one of the more powerful statements about the potential for harm of over-intervention. This is the cover of a report and a legal opinion that I gave. Sometimes when you say this is how it is, this is how it must be, you're playing with quite a long game and this is an example that I'm going to come back to of quite a long game. This relates to a policy in Scotland about which I'm going to make quite detailed reference later. Uh, a policy to appoint a named person to every child in Scotland with the responsibility to provide support to the child but also to receive information about concerns about the child and potentially to convene multi-agency conferences and to decide how to deal with and respond to those concerns. A very brief extract from my opinion which was in 2013 when this was only draft legislation and I said I'm specifically um, invited to answer a question about uh, the named person part and whether it's compatible with European law. <coughs> and the short answer is, it's not. And I set out why. Quite a few other people pointed out the problems, but this particular piece of uh, legislation, draft legislation at that time, has some good in it and some bad in it. And many of the responses try to be even-handed and praise the good and not the bad. And the criticism sometimes got overlooked. I think that I was relatively unique in saying this is the point at which this draft legislation will fail. And specifically from the next paragraph, um, European Union law relating to data protection and human rights law relating to the right to private and family life. So, a clear opinion then, not only on the law, but I also comment upon the utility. In other words, but is it sensible? Even if it were lawful, would it be sensible? And I'm going to have something to say about even if it were lawful, would it be sensible as well? And there was another phrase in that that you might have seen, UK legislatures must act compatibly with it. And I just flag up that I'm not claiming and expertise in the processes that you've got next month and what's going on in Tinwald. Um, I'm sure that I might be able to respond at the end in the light of things that you tell me about what's going on, but I'm claiming that I'm talking about things that UK legislatures have to comply with, wherever they are. And indeed, because we're talking about EU law and human rights law, it's not only UK legislatures, it's also legislatures across the whole of Europe who have to do what I'm saying. So that's my claim to some kind of expertise in predicting uh, what's going to go wrong because we know what legislatures have to do. So, third thing I've done, written a book. Uh, it's not published yet, it's due to be published in 2017. It's part of a series on social work law. 
um, and it specialises in human rights, that is by specialist area. And in the book, I said this about that case, because I wrote it before we knew what the outcome was. I said, I can't see how the scheme accords with human rights principles. Although it applies to Scotland, the principles, of course, are much wider. If the Supreme Court were to authorise the scheme to take effect, this would represent one of the most significant shifts in our understanding of human rights for decades. I think some of you may know, of course, the Supreme Court um, agreed with my opinion. It didn't allow the scheme to take effect. It has said it's not allowed to be implemented because it does indeed breach data protection and human rights laws. The fourth thing I mentioned, I'll come back to, devised a conceptual framework. You'll see this image, and I'll pick it apart a little bit. It's called the trapezium of care. But essentially, it has a linear um, range of state care from poor care to good care, and of family care from poor care to good care. And it's how state care and family care compare and interact that I will talk about a little. So, any claims to expertise, fundamentally, I'd like to link them to things that I've done rather than to who I am, and I hope that that's helpful to approach it in that way. Now, so from there, I'm going to talk about uh, the perceived problems, the perceived solutions, and then a positive way forward. Here we have, in a nutshell, a dichotomy that I'm going to come back to over and over and over again two different roles for children's services. One role to support children in need, which includes children in deprived circumstances, it includes children with disabilities, it actually is quite a broad range and a broad definition, but it's to provide support to those families. And another role to protect children at risk of significant harm. And I have presented that and I will come back to it over and over again, as two distinct roles. And some of the legal mistakes that I'm going to keep coming back to arise because we try to merge those two functions into one. And I'll explain how that happens. And you may recognise this is Victoria Climbier. Victoria Climbier, it has to be said, uh, died in the most horrific circumstances um, at the hands of the family with whom she was living. And although there have been many other uh, tragedies, many other deaths, this one really, really caught hold in the public imagination, to the extent that a whole set of government initiatives on the mainland um, were directly linked to and attributed to a response to Victoria Climbier's death. One of those was there was a green paper and then a white paper and then a whole tranche of government policies under the slogan, Every Child Matters, directly attributed to Victoria Climbier's death. Now, Every Child Matters essentially comprised an example of the blurring between the two things that I talked about. Because on the one hand, universal services were to be made available. On the other hand, via the 2004 Children Act that was also attributed to Victoria Climbier's death, a database of all children in England was to be established called the Children's Information System. Now there is a critical legal difference between making services available to everyone who wants it and creating a system to monitor every child whether they want to or not. But under cover of it must never happen again, we blurred that distinction and justified we're going to do those two different things. Every Child Matters has actually been moved on since 2010. Um, it's fallen by the wayside because 
Most of it was policy rather than law, and it simply got quietly dropped. It isn't the way in which services are delivered in England anymore. The mantra, it must never happen again, is a really powerful mantra. And in fairness, it doesn't just come from politicians, it comes from the media, and it comes from the public, who listen to what really is a horrific story, in the case of Victoria Kimbier and Baby P and many other tragedies. But I actually want to pause for a moment and unpick the mantra, it must never happen again, and say three things. How are we going to stop it? Who is going to stop it? What are we going to put in its place? I'll take them in turn. This is Eileen Munro. Eileen Munro is holding there the Munro Review of Child Protection. She's uh, brought in by the government to review child protection after the death of baby P, another death also involving her in game along with, um, they crop up quite a lot in child protection cases in the UK. Um, but slightly earlier than the Munro Review, she wrote this article, it's called Confidentiality in a Preventive Child Welfare System. It's published in a journal called Ethics and Social Welfare. It is an excellent article on the subject of confidentiality and protecting children. I'm just going to take you to a couple of snippets from what she wrote. As I say, uh, government advisor still involved in advising the English government. <coughs> There's an obvious attraction to the idea we're able to predict and so prevent serious social problems. But any kind of screening programme needs to be judged against three measures, predictive accuracy, treatability and the level of damaging effects. Now, predictability is the first that she talks about. Does the screening process result in risk assessments with an acceptably high rate of accuracy? In predicting risk of child abuse and neglect, existing risk instruments lead to an unacceptably high level of false positives, families inaccurately deemed to be a high risk, and a high level of false negatives, dangerous families wrongly judged safe. She is highlighting an important point that it is a problem for child protection both if you fail to detect the families who are a real risk and to protect the children and if you intervene in order to protect children where it's not necessary. She's also highlighting that we do not have the knowledge base that enables us to prevent false positives and false negatives. She's also pointing out that we therefore need to be very cautious about imposing a programme based upon the mantra of it must never happen again, which is essentially saying we must eliminate every possible false negative because we pay a high price in all of the false positives, all the people that we intervene in the lives of unnecessarily. In fact, for a government advisor, this is pretty strident criticism of the government's policy. This is, of course, the English government's policy. Power corrupts. It's not beating about the bush. There is no acknowledgement of the possible danger of increasing state power over families. There is no recognition that liberal societies have placed a value on privacy and confidentiality precisely because they present an obstacle to the state. The state sees this in a negative light, the individual values it as a protection of their freedom. The ethic of confidentiality is seen by the government as an obstructive barrier to be removed. The ethical principle is a protective barrier, defending the individual against excessive intrusion by the state. That is the message that one of the key government's child protection advisors was trying to convey about false positives and false negatives and about the importance of getting confidentiality right. But of course at the same time there is recognition within that quote about how saying we can't intervene 
is seen by government as a problem. So, of course, what then runs through the system is that the very wise insights and recommendations don't get through to policy because the government is driven by it must never happen again. What else is wrong with it must never happen again? The second one I said is who is going to make sure it doesn't happen again? Now, here I'm going to have a little bit of a personal plea, maybe, because you will have picked up, um, Roger mentioned, I am um, qualified and I practice as a social worker and I represent social workers. And I mention that because social workers are being set up to be responsible for it all. The idea is that everybody is going to have to refer any kind of concern. And in England, we're talking about uh, mandatory reporting, a duty to report any concerns subject to criminal sanctions. And they're talking about up to five years in prison for a social worker for failing to protect a child, to criminalize the social worker. So every other professional can discharge their duty by referring to my profession. My profession can get deluged by referrals of low-level concerns because it's mandatory to refer, so anything we've got any concerns about gets referred on to social services. We miss the real ones, and we're threatened with going to prison for five years. So it's a bit of a personal plea to say, let's not set up a system to make it mandatory to scapegoat social workers. <clears throat> And my third concern about um, it must never happen again is, of course, it must never happen again is built on the assumption that I'm going to look at a little, in a little bit more detail that the state can take a child away from their family and provide something better in its place. Now, this headline here, 1,400 victims of PC Brigade, and you see it in various other um, papers, refers to Rotherham, and it refers to 1,400 uh, girls in Rotherham within the care system being systematically sexually abused because the care system fails to protect them from systematic sexual abuse. So in the name of protecting children from abusive families, we have on a massive industrial scale children being abused within the care system. We can't say it must never happen again, built on the premise that the state has the means and the wherewithal to step in and provide something better, when manifestly what's happening here is the state steps in and on an industrial scale, it's not better. So, I mentioned a number of different policies that seek to blur the clear distinction between providing support to families that want it on the one hand and protecting children from significant harm whether or not they want it on the other hand. Um, I've referred to Every Child Matters. That attempted to blur the two roles by blurring the provision of universal services with the maintaining of a universal database. Working together used to have something called an initial assessment and the purpose of an initial assessment was to decide whether this child was a child in need or a child at risk of harm. So the government rewrote the guidance to say let's scrap the initial assessment, you no longer need to do triage in order to decide whether this is a child in need or this is a child at risk of harm. So that is another example of a measure that blurs that critical distinction that I'm saying is a critical legal distinction. MASH is an abbreviation that you may or may not have heard of. It stands for multi-agency safeguarding hubs. The idea is that they are multi-agency, uh, they call them sealed hubs, multi-agency organisations that a referral, instead of coming to social services, comes into this hub and therefore is immediately, straight away, seen by all of the agencies that are in the hub. MASH is something that my case of Haringey attacked and said, you can't do that. 
there was unlawful sharing if you are sharing information before you have assessed is this a child in need of support or is this a child at risk. And um, across England, the multi-agency safeguarding hubs had to rewrite their rules to require the hubs to first of all assess at the point of entry whether or not there was any right to share with the other people in the hubs depending on which of the two things it was. But the very creation of the hubs was intended to blur the distinction once again. And in Scotland I've referred to the named person scheme. In the named person scheme we had three roles, one of them to provide support, that's the one that we recognise on one side of our dichotomy, the other one to receive concerns and to convene conferences to act on concerns, that's on the other side of the dichotomy. So each of those are four examples of how we react to uh, child tragedies by saying what we need to do is we need to lower the threshold, we need to blur it a bit, we need to make sure that we can get in to do child protection in as many cases as possible, but we aren't necessarily asking the legal questions that we need to and that I'll come to. So, I think I'm doing alright on time because this is kind of the third bit, thinking differently. I'm going to talk about human rights in the known persons case, and I'm going to talk about that trapezium of care that I referred to earlier as ways of thinking differently. So, first, human rights. There are two rights that I'm going to talk about, one more than the other. The one I'm going to talk about more than the other, I've actually reproduced in this next slide, it's Article 8. Article 8 is the right to respect for private and family life. Article 8 refers to Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, so this is human rights law as it's understood across the Council of Europe, not the EU, the Council of Europe is a lot bigger, the Council of Europe includes uh, loads of countries in Eastern Europe, Russia and beyond, um, includes, includes Turkey already, it's a very widely uh, signed up to um, body across Europe and the um, west side of Asia. It's paragraph two that I want to unpick for a moment. It says there shall be no interference by a public authority with private and family life except such as is in accordance with the law necessary in a democratic society for the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. To be very clear, Across Europe, we understand that you cannot compulsorily intervene in private or family life without meeting the conditions of Article 8.2. Before we impose compulsion upon any family anywhere in Europe, we need to be sure that it is, in accordance with the law, necessary, not just desirable, necessary within a democratic society and for protecting the rights and freedoms of others. If we are not satisfied on any of those things, we are going to breach human rights when we compulsorily intervene in the lives of children and families. As I said, in the main person case. And these, there's quite a few extracts from what happened in Scotland and Scotland's attempt to do two things, blur the boundary, lower the threshold. This first one, oh, before I talk about what it says, the term a negative right might not be familiar, but it's kind of really important here. In human rights terms, a negative right is a term that means the right to be left alone by the state. The right to push the state away. The right not to be subject to arbitrary interference. 
By contrast, a positive right is a 